Thank you very much, Kemi, for that um, glowing introduction. Yeah. I take it everybody can hear. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I also do recognize that sometimes the line may be shaky, which is what, especially if it's video. And so sometimes people may decide to go under the icon and I seem to be talking to a blank wall with the name on it. <laughs> so that too I understand because that's what the pandemic has done for us. Um, you, we have to teach utilizing the uh, technology, but the, the strength of the technology depends on where people are located. And it's not just people in the third world. Even here in the United States, we do have the third world. So there are places where people don't even have internet, let alone being able to connect. So if you feel you have to go under the um, blank ad because of your data and things like that, I do understand. Um, let me begin by saying that when we began gender, it was very important to us how Africa, particularly African women and Africa culture um, were being represented in the United States, but more importantly, the United States and the Western world. Because what happens in the United States also carries over or is mirrored in other parts of the Western world. And what do I mean by Western world? Wherever white people are in control. So there's a perception as to how we talk about Africa and we talk about African women and the ways in which African women are literally placed at the bottom of the totem pole of uh, intellectual activity and in terms of whatever achievements they have made. So at the point we began gender um, at the um, turn of the uh, millennium, the, the dialogue at that time was, anytime you see African women, what you hear immediately is a mutilated woman. Mutilated is FGM. And in fact, it wasn't even beyond some of the students to ask in the class to you, the direct, to the professor, are you mutilated? Are you genitally mutilated? So that level of disrespect, that level also indicates the lack of awareness of um, Africa and, the, um, and people but more fundamentally, it taught us a lesson about the politics of knowledge. Most Africans approach knowledge as knowledge, something objective, something you strive for. Nobody ever attributes any negative thoughts to participants of knowledge. The assumption is that we are all working in a concerted fashion to unravel the mysteries of the world we, we live in and to better understand ourselves. Unfortunately, that is the aspiration and that is an ideal that has been taught to Africans by former colonial masters. And I'm using this word in quotes. But the issue is that what they were teaching it's not necessarily objectivity in relation to knowledge, but objectivity in how it enhances their own dominance and their own importance in the world. So whatever there is any idea of something that has, is seen as progressive, civilizational, that is defined as white. The Europeans came with it or the white Americans invented it. Anything that is negative, that becomes by default the blacks. So there's a, a, a tendency of amplifying the negativity of blacks and other 
peoples of colors around the world. Their achievements are never highlighted. In fact, even if you look into the history or history uh, books, it's all marginalized. The history of the world is the history of white people dominant in the world. We don't have a good sense of the history of Africans or Chinese or Indians. Those are things you have to go and learn on your own if you happen to have any interests. Otherwise, it's not there. So when gender came uh, out, we realized that journals are not necessarily something there that you move into without really thinking deeply about your cognitive and intellectual location. What is your work designed to do? What are the aspirations? What do you hope it will achieve in the world in which we live? How is it going to make us, and I mean us in terms of Africa and the women, much more understandable? So as opposed, in, as opposed to using a pathological lens to talk about Africa, we now have to utilize a lens that accurately represents what we are all about. It doesn't mean that you don't talk about, you don't see any shortcomings in African culture or in African women's, but the shortcomings have to put, be put in context so African women are not necessarily all bad, uh, all victims of violence or um, have no knowledge. Even this whole idea of the girl child, all of that comes from a negative place that doesn't look at the full range of what Africa and the women are in their various locations in their various families and in the ways in which they even today are changing reality and changing their societies. So yes, we will look at shortcomings, but the narrative of the African women isn't a narrative of shortcomings. There are narratives of triumphs. There are narratives of challenges there's narratives of pioneering. In fact, a lot of the histories that belong to African women have been moved over to the male side of the line and presented as male histories. The men did this. Whereas in many cases, it was the women who pioneered it, women who did it, women who changed the societies. But the narrative, because uh, the recorders of the history come with an intellectual framework. And that intellectual framework is one in which one, men are always dominant. It's an intellectual framework that says that in Africa, men have to be dominant and that women, as they know, which is part again of their conceptual framework, women are not dominant. So it's not a framework that accurately represents reality, social uh, life, differences in culture. It is a framework that is ideologically set. And so if you're going to write histories, theorize, about societies, analyze the lives of women from an ideological perspective that Africans had no part in shaping, you are going to get all negative theorizing. So the push for gender and we use gender in kind of a mockery, sarcastic, sarcastic manner, because 
anytime you talk about women issues now, gender comes up. So it's a case of, and at the time, in the, the time the journal was um, coming up, and at the time I even came to the West to do my PhD, and people were talking about gender and how under gender women are subordinated and women had no voice. And, and I looked at, and I asked them, what are you talking about? Which women are you talking about? Which is what I mean by ideological framework. Because if they've told me, oh, you know, white women are subordinated and all that, I have my said, okay, let me study a bit about the white woman to see what it is. The argument was women all over the world, women per se, are subjugated and dominated by men. And I said, which women are you talking about? Not the women in my reality. And I know that the women in my reality, even at the time of colonization, they were taking the war to the British to the colonizers, arguing against, writing, protesting colonization, some of them even going to war. These are not the histories of the women I know about. So how can we now start with a category called gender that automatically erases our histories and replaces that histories with another that doesn't capture the realities of my mothers, my grandmothers, my great grandmothers, and down the line. So gender was a sarcastic tool to use. And so it became a journal of African women and culture because part of the scholarship is to recognize that everybody is historically and socially located. Nobody's floating in a vacuum. Everybody has a culture. The culture that I may have in the context of Nigeria or um, the Eastern part of Nigeria or the Igbo part will be radically different from that of Harriet. Uh, Harriet, are you in Uganda? Yes. She's in yes, Uganda. I'm in Uganda. Harriet in Uganda. But it doesn't yes. mean that in Uganda, the women are passive or lack agency. What he's saying is that the histories are different, but you have to look at the dynamism of the women in their societies. And you tell the stories of that societies and what the women in those societies are doing. And of course, if we're looking at that, we're going to see that there are positive elements and women always are the ones who are pointing out the negative things that need to be changed. So we point that out. But it becomes a journal that looks at the analysis of the lives of women in relation to their culture and the importance of their culture. So that when I'm reading a work from Kenya and it's from the Gikuyu, I expect that there will be something of that culture that had made those women who they are which is the particularity of their culture, but the universal aspect of their culture is what they are doing that connects with all the other women in the neighboring region and even continent-wide. So Gender, a Journal of Culture and African Women's Studies was designed to begin to center, not to make African women periphery to scholarship, but to center the African woman and her experiences in scholarship. 
And when we began to do that, some of the issues that we encountered was that any time you said, this happens in this location relating African women. First off, it's impossible. African women couldn't have done it because we know, quote unquote, from history that they are subordinate beings. But some of the issues that was articulated in relation to the cultural norms and nuances, which is to say this is what created the spaces that gave African women the powers to do what they were doing. Those are the very same things that the white scholars are now appropriating and presenting as the progressive ways for change, all without acknowledging the role or anchoring that on what African women have been doing and what African scholars have been saying. So when you hear of Judith Butler talking out, talking about gender as performative, which was a concept that now tried to make gender flexible, whereas before gender was rigid and fixed. Some of that was coming out of the scholarship and the arguments of African women about the problems of gender and gender doesn't speak for us because gender is so located and anchored to biology and to culture in a way that it doesn't capture the realities and the social milieu of the African society that allowed for things to happen. So when Ifya Madiumena began to talk about um, male daughters taking two supposedly incompar incomparable concepts and putting it together, male and daughter, what does that mean? It was an attempt to address some of these issues, but we do know that the concept of male daughter is utilizing the West language to speak to the West. But the problem was that in doing so, we have to be careful not to fall into the pitfalls of the West because the concept she was describing did not assign the type of cognitive weight to males. This is a matter of being, this is what is in the culture. What is in the culture wasn't about daughters trying to be male. Daughters were trying, were affirming their rights as members of their family. They were trying to be males, but she could only capture it for males, for, for, for the West, where she utilized these concepts to kind of get them to wake up. Nevertheless, the ways in which that they have now been trying to modify the concept of gender, opening it up, trying to enclose a lot of other things actually came from the scholarship of African women, but they are not acknowledging it. Which is to say that in the work of a journal and in the process of writing and shepherding articles through, it has to be a no holds barred approach. You are not looking to the West to tell you about yourself. You know yourself and you speak from the location of yourself and you know they are going to say, doubt it, question it, challenge it. But because you know yourself, those challenges are irrelevant but you have to claim your knowledge rather than allow them to tell you what it is you are saying, whether it's true. And then later they will claim that knowledge and present it as if they discovered it. 
So most people don't seem to realize that when you send your paper out for uh, publication in many journals and it is rejected, it doesn't mean your paper was bad. Sometimes what you are presenting is so far off the radar for them that it can't possibly be true. And from the point of it can't possibly be true, they'll reject it, they'll take it, and then begin to, and begin to do their own research. The next thing you begin to see is that your ideas that you had put in the paper are suddenly coming out and you're wondering, when I was writing this paper, there was nobody writing about it. But now suddenly people are writing about it. Okay, so you take your paper, you go to another journal and then they'll tell you, cite that white girl or that white woman's paper that had come out. The question is, where did that white woman get the, the idea from? So you're now citing the person who got your idea and because the person is white, and white connotes rationality and intelligence and careful methodical research, they'll present, they'll publish the paper. And so the only way the African can get credit for the idea they were studying in the first place was to cite the white woman or the white man who took your ideas when it was sent out for review. And that has been the pattern. Or you are told to cite a professor you've been working with who happens to be white. So somebody in the, in the North or West so that your ideas can be validated. So this is not just for uh, African women, it's happened a lot to African men as well. And so these are the issues that gender is fighting for, recognizing that when ideas come in, if there's anything to clean up, it might be the language, but it's not necessarily the ideas that they have. Another thing, People now talk about um, same-sex marriages. And Africans will say nothing like same-sex marriages. The issue is that Africans had same-sex marriages, but it was not based on sexuality. Because marriage is based, is a social practice. And marriage is utilized to create families. And the concept of family is not based on male and female, which is couple. When you're talking of your family in the African way, it's not about a couple. It's a whole range of people. Your grandmother is part of your family. Your aunt is your family. In fact, in many cases, we don't even have words for aunt, nieces, nephews, uncles. It's either your father or your mother or your sibling. If it's a generic word, it's a sibling. And we don't have any problems understanding the intricacies of family ties because our notion of family is expansive. So when anthropologists begin to talk about um, the extended family in Africa, the question is extended from what? We have our family, our families are multi-generational the reason they are talking about African families as extended is because they are using the couple 
as a norm. And the couple as a norm is one in which the male is the dominant partner in the marriage. Go back and look at the history of their laws and of their societies. The man is the king of the castle. So when marriage is now built on couple, coupledom, any other family is now measured from that, which is why what is the norm for us is suddenly problematized by extended. Well, what do you mean by extended? That person, oh, that's my, uh, um, my sibling. But that's not your mother's child. So? So if it's not your mother's child, it has to be step sister or step brother. Or it has to be a niece or a nephew or a grand niece or great grand niece. And for the Africans at that point, is that it's too much? It's either my siblings or not. <laughs> they are members of my family. I may choose not to relate with them, but all these grandniece, great grandniece, aunt, great aunt, and all of that, it's problematic. Which is to say, the language you use in describing yourself and in describing your work speaks a lot about who you are. And if we are not challenging, looking at and questioning even those concepts, you find you begin to describe your families in ways in which is alienated from them. So in a sense, you describe yourself in an alienated way as a foreigner describing themselves. But you know who you are. So why describe yourself in the language of the foreigner? And so when the Kenya Supreme Court made it permanent that women can inherit from their spouses who are women, this wasn't an argument built on the LBGTQ politics, it's built on an older framework where women did marry in the past. In the Eastern part of Nigeria, women married women. You get to Gikuyu, in Kenya, women married women. Were they marrying it because they wanted to go to bed with other women? No. They had a different logic to what they were doing. So we need to preserve our own logic. And in preserving our own logic, what we are doing is challenging the whole concept of marriage. What does it mean? Is marriage something that the society defines for itself to work for its objectives? Or is marriage something that the whites have put out and we all march in lockstep to the ways in which they see marriage? I'm throwing these two examples out just to pinpoint some of the deeper questions that underline what one, the trajectory of scholarship, the problematics of even the terminologies we used, but more importantly, how we now need to begin to rethink and decolonize our own minds. And so the whole goal of gender is to decolonize minds. And we decolonize our minds by actually interrogating 
and writing about our societies in very critical ways. And when I say critical, we, critical isn't what we read in books. Critical is contesting what we read in books, as well as analyzing how the society has structured things. And recognizing too, that some of the greatest beneficiaries of colonialism and the narrative of the subjugation of women in Africa have been African men. Which is why they can get off talking about this isn't African. And all you have to do is look into their families. The very same thing they are contesting is not African was the very same thing their mothers did or their great grandmothers did. Two, we question some of the terminologies. <clears throat> Sub-Saharan Africa. What exactly does that mean? So if you're located in Africa and Africa has been accustomed to seeing itself as one and with trade routes stretching from Northern Africa to West Africa, to East Africa and to Southern Africa. What do they mean by Sub-Saharan Africa? And the assumption that Northern Africa is only white pigmented people falsifies the narrative because all you have to do is go to Egypt, not the pictures that come from Egypt or the pictures that come from Morocco. Even the Tuaregs are very dark people. Keep moving forward up. So even in our continent, the structure of our continent, we are being forced to see our continent in the ways in which white people want you to see your continent. And African scholars join in by talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of the issues that affect people in Northern Nigeria, Southern Nigeria is also faced in, in um, North Africa. And take a look at the maps. If it's Sub-Saharan Africa, how do we understand Niger? or Chad, or Mali. Because those ones stretch into North Africa, as well as below the Sahara. So they see the Sahara as a barrier. The people who live there don't see the Sahara as a barrier because it was straight routes. So I'm throwing these things out to say that the job that you now have is a very challenging one in the sense that when you start, I'm not going to tell you this is what you have to write about. My goal is to paint the narrative, the background picture, the war that is situated in the area where you are going to be working. To see the fault lines that are there. To then ask yourself, what is going to be your own legacy in presenting the African woman, in representing the African woman, in centering the African woman, what is going to be your own legacy? How are you going to move the discussion forward? Not the battle that we have fought, because now we have passed, we are passing on the baton to you. Because whatever decisions you are making, 
is the decisions your children will live by. So we are going to ask yourself, what kind of future am I arguing and fighting for, for my child? And it's not just fighting for my child in Africa, but understanding that my fight for my child in Africa is going to be in relation to how the larger world situates and sees Africans. Is it one in which Africans and my child, we, the mothers, will work hard to teach them to subjugate themselves, be good st students of white people, affirm the white perspective of Africa, be humble, allow themselves to be taught about themselves from a white perspective? Or is it one in which we prepare them to take their place in a rapidly integrating world. In the 40s and 50, a woman, a Wolof woman, slapped her child across the mouth when he came back from school and told her that part of what they were learning in school was that um, our ancestors, they go war. You know, the French polony of education is that of total assimilation and teaching the children that their ancestors are the goals. And so when the child came out telling the mother how their ancestors are the goal, she just went after him took him by the ears and ran him around the compound. This is your ancestor. How do they look like the girls? That's your ancestor. How do they look like the girls? She didn't go to school. We took on the baton now, a perception of Africa was being portrayed. African women, as all mutilated, genitally mutilated. And so the only way they could engage us was to put our clitoris and the labia majora and labia minora on the table for every little person to come and jump up and down. And yet, even in places where the surgery is practiced, it's a minority, not the entire, entirety of Africa. And even those that practice it, there was no attempt to understand what was going on. And the assumption was that it was dictated by the men. Men had nothing to do with it. And one of the things that Lee McBoway was talking about recently when she came to Cornell was that her grandmothers in her line, they were the ones who did the surgery. But her father was the one who insisted, no, it wasn't going to continue. So the representation of the dynamics of the male and female in Africa does not always correlate to what is reproduced in scholarship or to what the, is presented in the politics of knowledge. You are now at a point, pivotal point where China is becoming dominant. The question is what narratives are you going to present for African women in this sort of globalizing world that makes African women stand out. I teach students who are from China. When I teach about African women, 
And these are taking historical examples as well as cultural practices present them. It blows their minds because that kind of history never existed in China. But if we do not hold our own stories, and if we do not analyze our own social practices, as the Chinese come up, what will be our narrative? And it's not just our narratives, what will be the narratives of the future generation of young women? So I'm going to stop there.